All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest, our uh, every other week live stream. And apologize for the brief technical delay right as we went to start. I reached up to say, hey, boys, let's go live. And my fuse popped. So apologies for that. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. See a handful of people already showing up. Good evening, Joshua. Good evening, Andrew. I'm sure we'll have more come in. I see 15 of us here already. Uh, Jim, Andy, you know both of them. Uh, historian James Taub and historian Andrew Roscoe. And new face here tonight to us, but a veteran to any of you who've been trying to enjoy history through quarantine. Jake Wynn, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So, well, let's start with you. They know all our faces and mighty bored they'll be. Would you introduce yourself and who you represent, please? Absolutely. Um, again, my name is Jake Wynn. I'm the Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. And I am stationed at one of our branch museums, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum, which is in Washington, D.C., which is where I live. I also blog on the side and do lots of other cool stuff with Pennsylvania in the Civil War. Very cool. Well, Jake, thanks for being there. And it's the medicine in the Civil War uh, that has you with us tonight as our live stream tonight. Those of you who have joined us over the past couple of months, we've been talking about the the question that allows us to have this discussion is where does the Civil War fit in the in the timeline of history? Is this the last, mo uh, last Napoleonic War or first modern war? And we use that as a construct as a way to be able to carry the conversation. And tonight's conversation definitely is uh, about medicine and medical advances. Uh, before we go into it, uh, we are sponsored this evening by a whole bunch of folks who jump up and step in and help, and those are the CWDD Coffee Grinders, the folks who support Civil War Digital Digest on Patreon. Um, I'll put a link to Patreon here in a little bit if you want to know about it, but since we last met, I want to say thank you to Ron Coddington, uh, for joining after b doing Cardomania with us. He surprised me. Bob Gobtop promoted. Dean Woods, Cameron Griffith, and Matthew Palmer joined. It's those folks uh, committing a little bit of money each month or for as little as $3, as much as $20 a month. want to say thank you to them uh, because it just makes such a difference. It makes this possible. Jake, I'm going to put you on the spot because I know you guys are a nonprofit in a museum. I know you've got a regular canned pitch, and I didn't tell you this was coming. Your turn. Give the pitch for the museum, please. Absolutely. National Museum of Civil War Medicine is a nonprofit organization. We haven't had admissions from about the middle of March until just this past uh, two weekends. We've been open to the public for the first time since the pandemic. So we've been asking if, if people enjoy our programming. We do a lot of work over on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Civil War Med is our handle. You can find us there. Uh, if you enjoy that program, you enjoy what we're talking about tonight with medicine in the Civil War, you'll love what we do at the museum. Uh, and uh, you can support us by becoming a member, uh, by donating. Uh, we have a page on our website dedicated to that, civilwarmed.org slash support. I'll put that into the uh, comments section as well of this video. So if you want to go and support us, you can do that there. Great. Thanks. Well, talking about support, let's get into it. I see a whole bunch of folks chirping in here. Uh, Newsboy Donnelly, Barbara Schultz, Laura Roscoe. Andy, you can say hi to your mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Eric Urbanis is with us. Neil Weather, uh, Weatherington is with us from Alaska. Huck Green is with us. Andrew Pleva. So great to see all you folks checking in. Thank you so much. Good evening, Shane Pinson. Let's get going. Obviously, we've talked about technology and weaponry, and, th and those uh, change during warfare all the time. Another thing that we see change you want to see medicine move forward, a war is going to do it for you. Let's take a look about that and let's talk. Uh, Andy, let's have you start off. Uh, we're going to talk for a little bit here about medical technology. And the first thing I want to say, our first thing I want to uh, open up with is let's talk about ambulances. Yeah. So, you know, prior to the Civil War, you know, you'd see this beginning with the Napoleonic Wars, this interesting shift in technology. Up until then, you know, the war, the beginning of modern warfare, you see, you know, up through the American Revolution stuff, you still see medicine being practiced a lot the same way that it had for centuries before. And suddenly between the end of the Age of Enlightenment, you start to see developing new techniques. And then the ideas of the Industrial Revolution are starting to get put into place. 
One of the really cool things for me is Baron LeRay, who is a French surgeon. He's the Surgeon General of the French Army during the Napoleonic Wars. He's the one who develops this idea of a that the largest controllable factor, and controllable is important, that existed at the time was getting men to treatment more quickly. And honestly, today with military medicine, that's one of our biggest drivers even today, is getting men treated as fast as possible. So his idea is rather that is getting men from the battlefield back to an aid station where surgeons could see them more quickly. So he developed, uh, and you should be seeing a picture of it come up on the screen, is he developed a what we the first modern ambulance, the idea that you have something that's light, fast, and relatively comfortable for troops who are injured to be carried on, and that they can get from there. Trained specialists can be there working with them. They can get them back to surgeons that can then treat their wounds faster. This is before plasma. This is before whole blood. This is before any kind of ability to stabilize a patient. So you have to get your fighting shock, and you have at that point no uh, um, anesthesia. So you're trying to get surgeries done as quickly as possible because shock is going to be a big issue for a lot of these soldiers all the way up through the Civil War for sure. And I mean, even today, shock is one of the biggest determinants of whether someone's going to live or not on a battlefield wound. Okay, great. <clears throat> as we take that and we look at what's going on at the end of the Napoleonic War there, Jake, would you pick up and take us forward? Yeah, so there's going to be evolutions with battlefield medicine that are going to take place as we move towards the American Civil War. Uh, Crimean War is a, is a big one that is gonna see some changes made to some of the systems that were set up during the, uh, during the Napoleonic era. Uh, you have new technology becoming available. So things like railroads, things like steamships, they're gonna make evacuation faster. But of course, most of the time, you're still relying on wheeled, horse-drawn ambulances. The Civil War is going to see a major change. This is a big thing we talk about at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and that is going to be the reforms that are done during the Civil War by a gentleman known as Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Letterman was the medical director of the Army of the Potomac uh, from the summer of 1862 until the end of 1863. So he's going to be the medical director in charge of that main Union Army in the eastern theater of the conflict for first battle is going to be Antietam, Battle of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville and Gettysburg. So for those main battles that we know of as being very influential in, in all different aspects of, of looking at warfare and military strategy are also going to be key and vital to the evolution of mil military medical evacuation. And Letterman's going to create a system, which we call today the Letterman Plan, which basically puts down the basis in America uh, using some of the same tenets from Luray back in the, uh, back in the Napoleonic era, and bringing it forward and using some of that modern technology. So for the first time in American history, there is going to be a medical system that is going to see soldiers from the moment they are wounded on the battlefield, they're going to move through a system that's going to see first aid on the battlefield to division-sized field hospitals. They're going to use technology like railroads and steamships then to transport patients from the battlefield field hospitals to larger established field, uh, larger general hospitals are going to be established in major cities or uh, important uh, geographic locations that are easy to access. And we'll talk more about those hospitals later. But this Letterman system basically creates in America for the first time an organized emergency medical system that, for the most part, is, is really still with us today in this country. Cool. Well, still with us today. Let's take it and let's punt forward as we move past the Civil War. Uh, Jim, we haven't heard a thing from you yet. Come on in and well, we're let's getting get into my time period. Well, yeah. we're, we're at it's, your time I mean, period and it's your turn, brother. Well, let's, get in, let's get into the First World War and talk a bit about a lot of the systems that were developed during the Crimean War, during the American Civil War, are then professionalized and standardized not only within the United States, but outside of it as well. As you start to see the birth of standardized medicine and branches solely dedicated to this. Uh, obviously, during the American Civil War, we have um, the Ambulance Corps on, on both the North and the South. Uh, but then, as a result of this, you also start to see the development internationally of the Service Sanitaire in France and also of the Royal Army Medical Corps in Great Britain, which will lead us into the First World War. And the basis with Jonathan Letterman uh, laid down during the American Civil War is expanded upon as new medical technology becomes available during, during the First or so you would have a soldier be taken off the battlefield or he was wounded or if he was sick and then immediately processed into a hospital through this ambulance system to the exact specialized care that he needed. 
instead of going to a general field hospital, say for any sort of wounds or any sort of sickness, you now see soldiers who are directed specifically towards an area that specializes, say, in internal wounds, uh, towards head wounds, or towards uh, certain types of, of other disabilities. So that specialized care is what really develops in this whole ambulance system. And probably the most important physical technology that changes this is you start to see motorized ambulances, right? So roads become, uh, as we've talked about in previous issue, uh, previous editions of this, roads become vitally important to transport the wounded out and to get them out faster. Um, because unlike these previous conflicts, there's a much larger amount of wounded that need to be evacuated out of a very small area and then dispersed to hospitals farther into the rear. Great. Uh, and Jim, just so you know, I just showed them the evacuation chart that you sent the other day from the front Perfect. line all the way back. So Yes, and that one, the one I sent that you guys just saw, uh, depicts an average British evacuation system uh, during the Messines Ridge fighting in the summer of 1917. Great. So... Well, we see a lot of people still checking in, saying hi, Connecticut, Maryland, Erie, Pennsylvania, Reading, Pennsylvania, Reading, Pennsylvania, sorry, from the Midwest here. Uh, lots of folks showing up and visiting. If you guys have questions for any of our three experts, feel free to chime in, ask them. Um, my job here is to react to your questions and pose them to our board. They may not necessarily see it, but it's something I can go for them. Uh, also, the playback of this is going to go on the Civil War Digital Digest YouTube channel, so anybody who visits there will hear what we're asking about. So, And what we're asking about next, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say a word to you fellas and pitch it and let's see what we talk about in medical technology. The word's triage. Andy? Yeah. Um, so to be explicit, triage is something that has already come around before the Civil War, but the term itself is not. And that's an important thing. Again, going to Baron LeRae, he's probably the, innovated across a lot of different different areas of medicine. And one of the other areas is the idea that we're going to treat men based on the severity of the wound. And that's what triage breaks down to. The modern system breaks it down to you lightly wounded, moderately wounded, severe, you know, severely wounded, and the people that are unable to be helped. And, you know, the idea that I want to see the person that I that needs my help the most that can still survive or has a good chance of surviving. And so he's going to begin to implement these ideas that, hey, if you've got a minor wound, I don't care if you're a lord or I don't care if you're important. You're going to sit for a little bit while this guy who needs immediate surgery to save his life is going to get seen. Um, and that's the idea of really starting to apply science to the idea of medicine, you know. It's interesting, and this time we're starting to see the end of the Age of Enlightenment. We're seeing the idea of a physician, a university-trained physician, vice just a surgeon who does it by trial and error, and the idea of applying a system to medicine as opposed to just haphazardly seeing whomever walks in in whatever order. Okay. Uh, Jake, do you want to pick that uh, pick up from there? Absolutely, and, and that's a great segue, too, because the Civil War is where that idea – uh, the idea of medicine is science and there needs to be systems and applying that knowledge that is being being learned and attained is going to be put into American medical circles. So this is where medicine in America is going to become much more scientific. And, you know, the, the idea of sorting who gets wounded first, triage, there is, you know, you can trace some of these ideas way, way back, uh, far earlier than the 19th century. But what the 19th century does, and we see it in the Napoleonic era, we see it in the Civil War, is warfare becomes so much more deadly, uh, more violent, the weaponry becomes more refined, and that means there are many, many more casualties that need to be dealt with in a short span of time. So you get to see battles, and this is one that you're going to hear me talk about Antietam again later, uh, but the Battle of Antietam is a good example of this. Uh, it's a, and it's actually one of the turning points in, in American medical history, because this is where we see Letterman's system for first being applied on the battlefield. 23,000 casualties in a single day. The U.S. Army has 10,000 wounded soldiers it needs to deal with uh, from 12 hours of combat. That requires some kind of organization. And so they don't call it triage, but that idea of sorting who gets treated first, and just as Andy said about sorting... Uh, based on the wounds and who can survive their wounds, that's what they, these doctors are doing. And by 1862, many of them are already becoming very professionalized. If they hadn't seen a gunshot wound before, they've seen plenty of them by this time. 
and they're becoming much better at deciding who will live if they receive medical treatment and who do we set aside, give some painkillers, and then if we have time, we will come back to them in the end. That idea is being fully fleshed out during the Civil War. Again, it's not called triage during the Civil War, and, and you'll be hard-pressed to actually find Civil War surgeons really writing about it. You'll see it, you'll come across this in some cases, um, but for the most part, it's happening in these situations where they're dealing with 60, 70, 80 men that they need to care for, and they need to do things like amputation, other surgeries that they need to, to do that are very time-consuming, but also uh, very stressful. So they're not talking about that sorting, but it is going on, um, and, and it is going to be you know, with both Union and Confederate armies through the Civil War, and that idea is going to go into emergency medical practices in the United States uh, and be used in the aftermath of the war in things like railroad accidents and industrial accidents. Um, as America becomes more industrialized and as the world becomes more industrialized, these ideas are going to become civilian practice as well. And then as, the con as we move towards the 20th century and towards World War I, the casualty lists are going to get longer and longer and longer, and these concepts are going to become even more important, which I'm sure uh, Jim has some thoughts about. Sure. And before I throw it over to Jim, because you mentioned how the surgeons were learning what bullet holes were in that, uh, that mm -hmm. lets me segue to a question from Eric Urbanis here. He says, question, during the Civil War, how much medical training, if any, was required before being admitted as a surgeon to the Army Medical Corps, North and South? That is a that is a fantastic question. Uh, at the early outset of the conflict, there was very little in the way of uh, you know proven experience that you needed to have. Uh, basically, pretty well you could call yourself a doctor if you had some experience. They would take you. There was a desperate need to get medical personnel into the army. Problem with this is, uh, and and also to go back just a little bit further, there is a an effort in the Jacksonian America that kind of took away the professionalization of medicine. Uh, that was much more kind of this populist impulse that well, everyone can be a doctor, you know? Why, why do we have to make this so elitist? Um, and the Civil War is going to kind of revert all of that because those, that has disastrous results for soldiers on the battlefield uh, who are being cared for by incompetent doctors, so-called doctors in some cases. Uh, by 1862, really, you start to see uh, kind of a clamping down on those medical personnel to say that if you don't meet these very, very strict standards, you're out. Uh, and you see that being implemented in the Union Army, U.S. Army, especially William Hammond becomes Surgeon General. He and Jonathan Letterman were very good friends. And they're going to create this kind of a test, uh, both a written exam and also kind of a practical that you had to prove your medical knowledge in order to get into the U.S. Army. And there's going to be Confederate medical departments. They're going to have systems like this. They're in more dire straits. They need more medical personnel. They're going to be a little more lenient because they have to be. Um, but there is a, a clamping down and a kind of a require of this professionalization uh, in order for you to practice military medicine. Uh, within the army. Now, when you get into contract surgeons and people that are brought in in emergency situations, that's a bit different. It's a little more lax. Uh, but for the most part, they have some pretty, pretty uh, strict standards in order to serve uh, within these armies during the Civil War as a doctor. Good. Andy, I see you trying well, to jump if I can jump. Yep, jump yeah, in. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to jump in for Napoleonic perspective of, interestingly, uh, to give a good example, is the British Army up through the whole Napoleonic Wars, 20 years of warfare has no standard uh, tests or anything like that to come in. But the guy named uh, James McGregor, he is becomes essentially the Surgeon General of the British Army right after the Napoleonic Wars. He's been Wellington Surgeon General on the peninsula and then at Waterloo. Uh, when he comes in, he actually institutes a series of tests. And it's interesting reading about that. Not only is he talking about anatomy and surgery and some of the stuff you expect of a doctor, but he's also talking about zoology and biology and some of those things that – would you understand that at the time people are still making their own medicine, that it makes sense that you would want someone with some knowledge of botany because you know they got potentially have to make stuff in the field? But it's interesting that they went from no standardization, no standards to actually fairly strict standards in a very short amount of time, all based off of – you know, two decades of warfare experience, but to show where the British Army's at at this period. Okay. And I would even add a little bit onto that before I jump in and I take over and go into the First World War and, and take it back to a topic I'm reading about in my own time right now, which is some of the medicine of the revolution. Um, you know, Benjamin Rush is one of the greatest sources and writers of the revolutionary era, and I got to give a shout out because he also founded my undergrad. 
But then you've also got interesting folks like Dr. David Griffith, who is not only the surgeon of the 3rd Virginia Regiment, he's also the chaplain. So there's, you know, these interesting mix of guys coming from all sorts of backgrounds and saying, well, I'm the doctor. But by the time of the First World War, as we sort of move through the Civil War and that experience, it's all very scientific standardized medicine. There's an international community of medicine. And we're going to see that really strengthened. Obviously, doctors are talking to each other in the 19th century. But in the 20th century, we see these academic um, sort of groups that still exist to this day, um, societies of physicians, societies of, of neurologists, etc. cetera. Um, and that really comes into play as they're all talking uh, to each other. And so the triage system, when we get to the First World War and when it is called triage, is, is very interesting. Jake cited the casualties at the Battle of Antietam. I'm going to cite the casualties of the first day of the Battle of the Somme. The British suffer over 50,000 casualties on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. It's the bloodiest day in British military history. Now 19,000 of those are killed. And that's a horrific number to really think about. But now we have to think about the thousands and thousands of others who are wounded, right? There's a large majority of wounded to those killed. And those men all have to be processed and then sent to spots of individual treatment. The British Army is completely overwhelmed by this. They also are suffering an acute shortage of medical staff to the point that they're actively recruiting American doctors to come over and serve. And when the U.S. enters the war, the U.S. Army Medical Corps' first assignment is to send doctors to the British Army because they're so short on, on medical personnel. But that treatment really and that triage really expands upon the theories that you saw in the 19th century, because, again, the types of wounds become so much more varied. You could be a doctor in the first line medical station where you have soldiers who have been brought to you fresh out of the front lines. One could have a gunshot wound. One could be suffering from concussion with no visible wound. And one could be a gas victim. You have to apply triage to not only the physical wounded, physically wounded soldier, but the soldiers who are suffering from neurological, respiratory, or many other types of wounds. So that triage and that theory of triage really needs to be expanded upon. And the scientific development of medicine that has occurred in the years between the American Civil War and the First World War has made it possible for these doctors to be able to combine multiple different types of medicine into one scientific theory of triage. Great. And Jim, what they're seeing right now is they're seeing the back of the truck with uh, wounded men sitting yeah. there with the cards, if you want to talk about that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, that is a fantastic photo. This photo comes to us from the National Archives. Um, and what that photo shows are wounded members of the 30th and 38th Infantry, or the 3rd Division during the Battle of the Marne. And, and we're almost actually dead on the day of the anniversary of that photo. Um, but you'll notice some interesting things. The, the photo is quoted as that these men are, are gas casualties. So you'll notice that a lot of them don't have any physical wounds. I think one or two of them might have some bandages on them. But what's also very interesting when we talk about specifically triage is you'll notice a lot of these soldiers have white tags on various parts in their uniform. And that's part of this new triage system we're entering in the First World War. As soon as they enter a medical station, they're going to receive one of these tags from medical personnel, and that's going to follow them all the way through their experience until they're at a stationary base hospital. Because each layer of doctor who they're going to experience in the triage system has to know what this man's wound is, what previous treatment if he's received, and the advice on where to go from there. So that's a really interesting picture, not only of the ambulance we talked about, uh, the modern evacuation system previously, but also the modern triage system you're starting to see with the First World War. Cool. Well, thanks. I'm glad we can get that in and get some context to that. Um, before we move on, let me pose a question here uh, that TJ Casey put in a little bit ago, and this is a Civil War-centric question. Were the hospital stewards kind of the nurse practitioner of the Civil War? Yeah, yeah, the, I'll, I'll jump on that one. We, uh, we call the, the hospital steward the workhorse of Civil War medicine. They're doing a vast majority of, of the work. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to these Civil War units, uh, and each each regiment was uh, usually assigned one hospital steward, and they are going to fulfill kind of all of the, you know, uh, clerical duties. Uh, many of the clerical duties are going to be performed by them. They're also going to be the pharmacists for the unit. And many in many cases, they're going to be the ones that are going to be procuring and then distributing medication. Uh, they're going to be uh, in the operating room in some cases. They're going to be the ones that are going to be helping to. Uh, monitor things like uh, patient breathing. If, if they're undergoing uh, an operation like an amputation, they're going to be uh, helping in, in the operating room. They're also going to be out on the battlefield too. So they have a, there's a fantastic story in our 
uh, on our website, we, we shared a few years back about a hospital steward at the Battle of Gaines Mill in 1862. He called himself, I love it, he called himself a uh, combatant non-combatant. Uh, he went into, he went into, the, into the battle all, armed only with his medical instruments and, and a small surgical kit accompanying a surgeon of the regiment. And he went out and performed first aid on the battlefield as well, in addition to all those other tasks that he had. So uh, the, the hospital steward is like the nurse practitioner, the pharmacist, the uh, doing the clerical work. They're doing pretty much everything and anything that the surgeon and assistant surgeon didn't want to do. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Uh, before we move on, Huck Green, I see your comment there. I'm not quite sure what the question is. Shoot a little bit more in there and we'll bounce it up, man. Thanks much. During that time, let's move on to something we talk about today and something that we hear, and that is germ theory. So, Andy, is that something you want to talk, yeah. or do we start in Civil War sure. there? I mean, I'll start just as the, you know, germ theory, again, it's a scientific theory, but there are commanders up until this point, even if you read like the Army Officer's Handbook, that understand through practical experience, generations, centuries of soldiering, People knew, hey, I have to police the camp. I have to make sure the water source is away from the latrines. Things like this. They might not have known why that was true, but they knew it was true. And that's one of the big things in the Civil War and the Mexican War, too, is there was a tremendous death rate in the Mexican War. And mm. even a, a ridiculous amount of them are non-combat deaths due to disease, due to poorly, poorly trained volunteer officers that are trying to... Uh, trying to adapt to army life and they don't know these techniques because remember in the Mexican war, the regular army is a much bigger part of the army and their officers stay with the units in the civil war. You see those regular army officers spread out more. So now they can spread that experience onto the volunteer forces. But if you read the publications at the time, officers knew that and the good officers really ensured their men, you know, police the camp and everything like that. They just didn't know why yet. And that seems like a great place to say, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, so the Civil War, one of the statistics that I'm sure we're, many of us that are familiar with the Civil War are familiar with is that two-thirds of those that died in the conflict, estimated to be around 700, 750,000 now, modern estimates put the, the death toll of the conflict, two-thirds of those died of disease. They didn't die of battlefield injuries or resulting complications. They, they straight up died of disease. There is a lack, a fundamental lack of understanding about what causes disease what causes infection during the Civil War era. They do not understand, they do not yet have the knowledge. The research that will eventually give everyone knowledge about this all around the world is being done. Now, we were talking, you know, talking about Louis Pasteur, uh, you're talking about um, uh, other folks in Europe doing some great research that is going to appear and be proven out, and borne out later in the 19th century. But during the Civil War, that knowledge is not yet even really been fully theorized. And so this means that there are competing ideas about what causes disease. Probably the most prevalent that you'll see is something called miasmatic medicine or miasma. You think of malaria. The malaria, the name actually means mal air, bad air. So you're seeing that, that the idea that miasmatic medicine is something that is spread through the air, that you can smell it, a bad smell. You go to a city, you go to the five points in New York and Manhattan during the 19th century. It smells terrible. Uh, it is a slum. And people recognize and connect that with disease. They connect those kinds of places. Well, what is an army camp during the Civil War, but sort of a slum out in the middle of the woods? There is, in many cases, these volunteer officers, as Andy said, they don't do a very good job of, of things like policing their latrines, cleaning up garbage, and the carcasses of dead animals. This means that infected water sources, you're going to have diarrhea, dysentery, typhoid fever. You're going to get malaria and yellow fever as well from mosquitoes, which they don't yet know cause malaria and yellow fever. So there's a lack of understanding, which is going to lead to this, this death toll being so high from disease during the Civil War. All of that being said, there is some new ideas that are coming around. They're starting to make some of those connections that Andy talked about. And this is from practical experience. And they're using the scientific method. So they're doing things like studies. They're trying to figure out what works in, in cases of, of infection. Um, and infection is one area that they're going to have some success. There's a, there's a disease, there's an infection that is known as hospital gangrene during the Civil War. 
you got it during 1862, 1863, it was 50 to 60% fatal if you got it. By the end of the war, it is down to 3 and 4% fatal. And that is because they find in a treatment that actually works. And they're putting, um, basically, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the uh, it was a bromine solution. So basically, think of it as like hot tub cleaner. Um, they have it very, very much uh, kind of watered down. It's not super uh, caustic, but it is caustic enough that it's going to kill off that infection. It also kills off into the healthy skin too, but it is effective. And so they're able to prove this. They don't know why it's effective, but they know that it works. And so they're using it. And there are some other connections like this that they're making during the Civil War. But by and large, when it comes to disease, there's very little knowledge gained about how to treat disease. And you can see this in the medications they use. And then I'll, I'll give up the floor. And that is the, the most common in, uh, treatment medicine you see used during the Civil War, especially in cases of diarrhea and dysentery, is mercury. Mercury is used as a medication widely. Millions of doses of it given out during the war. And this gets to the fundamental lack of understanding. This goes back to ancient times and, and goes back hundreds of years to this idea that if you have something in your body that's making you sick, you have to get it out of your system. So they're going to make you vomit. They're going to give you poisons. They're going to have you flush your guts even more than you're already doing with the idea, hoping that you'll get whatever bug, whatever thing is inside you that is making you sick, get it out. And that is going to lead to a lot more deaths. It actually makes the death toll increase significantly. Um, but again, there is this lack of understanding during the Civil War. And this is why that death toll is so high. Well, I must say, I feel a little bit better reading the comments. Well, Jake is going on here as we pass it off. Gene had the same thought that I did. You're talking about setting up camps and learning by experience. And Gene wrote, there's a famous scene in The Horse Soldiers in which the doctor, played by William Holden, advises that the latrine should not be placed upstream from the troops. Yes. And I, 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 was, I, had the, I had the same exact thought. I saw that same scene when you were talking. So, Gene, I'm right with you there. I will add to that. I mean, and this is something we talk about. The problem with that and the idea of, well, we, we must have our latrine down, downstream. Problem is in these army camps, you have 100,000 men living in close quarters. Somebody else's camp is upstream of you. And then it all dumps into the Potomac River. And that is where the city of Washington, many of the neighborhoods were getting their water from during the Civil War. So all those camps around D.C., they were kind of poisoning the water supply for the city of Washington. So this is, a, again, the problem is just so much bigger than they imagined uh, that they were facing during the time. Well, it becomes a real question, it becomes a real question of uh, density and how many people are in the same space. Some questions we face even today. Rather than going to today, let's move past the Civil War to World War I. Jim, what happens with germ theory as we go forward and how does it play out in your world? Yeah, well, I mean, to continue on the, the theme that Andy and Jake have kind of laid down, by the First World War, they understand it. Uh, I think that's kind of, I, I, I don't know how to really build upon the fact that they know diseases are a thing, and they know that it's not bad air. They know malaria is coming from mosquitoes. They uh, are taking precautions to it. I'm going to leave, obviously, the big egg for, for the very end here, but just to hit on just malaria as an example. It's understood that it's spread by mosquitoes and they're taking steps to uh, sort of rem remify the situation, but it's still going to have horrible impacts on armies that are operating in mosquito infested areas. And that's actually going to take us away from the Western Front, which we talk a lot about often, and look at battlefields like Salonika, which is in northern Greece, uh, where the British, the French, the Italians, the Russians, and the Serbians are fighting the Bulgarians, which are obviously the most famous theater of the First World War. Um, but... Um, you know, malaria is a big killer and it's taking a lot of guys off the line and to the point that every army there is issuing out mosquito nets. The British Army serving in Egypt, in Palestine, and the British Army serving in Mesopotamia all have to deal with these horrible tropic diseases that you wouldn't have experienced in Northern Europe. And obviously the big, big subject to talk about with germ theory of the First World War is the Spanish influenza. Um, and it, it, it just goes to show how they dealt with it at the time. When it was understood that it was an airborne strain of the flu, uh, quarantines go into effect, masks are issued out to soldiers and civilians around the world. Um, unfortunately, by the time that it is understood that it had, it had leaked out, and most historians now agree that it had come from a U.S. Army camp, uh, Camp Funston in Kansas, um, and a, a patient zero was actually an Army cook, 
um, it had already traveled on troop ships around the world. So um, there was that similar understanding, similar language to what we're hearing today in the current pandemic. So, so this idea of germ theory really had become modernized in the years in between the American Civil War and the First World War. World War I is the last war where more people will die due to disease than due to combat uh, in human history. Now, it would be the first war in which that wasn't the case if it wasn't for the Spanish influenza, which actually claims more victims separate of the war than the war itself. So um, it's it's something that is being understood. And, and now that it had been understood, new ideas on how to combat it on a global scale as the world had become more in- interconnected really uh, started to become developed. Great. Uh, Jake, when you get a gap here, I'm going to ask you to throw something into the comments here. I know you and Jim had a conversation on the Civil War on your guys' live stream some time ago that Jim just gave us the cliff notes of. You guys went into this for almost an hour. When you get a gap here, would you make a copy of that link and put it in the the comments in case anybody wants to chase that down and go look over at your site? Absolutely. Uh, I will do that here in in just a second. I I do want to, if it's okay, if I add in. Yep, jump in. a uh, we have a we have a piece on our website that we shared, which was by uh, written by W. W. Keene, who was one. He's he is like literally a bridge between the Civil War and World War One. He's an American surgeon that was just out of medical school in 1862, went and served on the battlefields of the Civil War, and is still working in his early 80s in the U.S. military during World War One. And he wrote about this transition period. And then there's a particular passage here that I think is is perfect and illustrates this. So um, I'll put this into the, into the comments as well. It's a fascinating piece. I highly recommend reading it. He says, quote, surgeons in 1861 to 65 utter, were utterly unaware of bacteria and other dangers. And in their ignor- ignorant innocence committed grievous mistakes, which nearly always imperiled life and often actually caused death. They operated in old blood-stained coats, the veterans of a hundred fights. They operated with clean hands in the social sense, but they were not disinfected hands. They used undisinfected instruments from undisinfected plush-lined cases, and still worse, used marine sponges, which had been used in prior cases and had only been washed in tap water. If a sponge or an instrument fell on the floor, it was washed and squeezed in a basin of tap water and used as if it were clean. The silk to tie blood vessels was undisinfected. One end was left hanging out of the wound and after three or four days was duly pulled upon to see if the loop on the blood vessel had rotted loose. When it came away, if a blood clot had formed and closed the blood vessel, well and good. If no such clot had formed, then a dangerous secondary hemorrhage followed and not seldom was fatal. So a little gory, but that's the reality of where where medicine was in the 1860s. And by the time you get to World War I, and he writes about this extensively. Uh, he actually says, quote, how differently, how utterly different our present methods, what he writes in 1918. So there's just such a huge gulf, a huge gap in the knowledge between Civil War and World War I. Um, and W.W. Keene, he lived through it and helped change it. Cool. Well, great. Thanks for sharing that. Primary sources are always a wonderful way to connect to history. Let's transition away from things we can't see, germs, to things we can see equipment so uh talk about how yeah go ahead andy i wanted to jump in because i have i have something that i remember talking about previously uh well we have a mutual friend that uh won't name here but you know he uh he's a professor of surgery as well as a uh works at a hospital in detroit that's both a civil war reenactor as a surgeon and a world famous surgeon um Interestingly, he's brought out his surgical kits, which looks just like Jake talked about. It's a plush line case. One of the things he always points out is the tools inside could pass in a modern hospital, with the exception of the fact that the handles are wood, and therefore I can't be disinfected. And you're, looking, is, you're looking at him right now, Andy. Excellent. Thank you. And like a modern surgeon would pick up these tools and understand them. And that's the important thing, I think, is we look back a lot of times on the Civil War surgeons and think, well, these guys didn't know anything because they had this ridiculous death rate. And like, yes, they obviously had lapses in their science. But in terms of the technique of surgery, it was surprisingly advanced for the time. 
you know, and I, I think that it's important that the, if the equipment they're using, obviously there's things like CAT scans and, you know, x-rays and all these things that make, you know, diagnostic tools that make medicine way better today. But in terms of the actual surgical tools, we're not looking at something terribly dissimilar from today. So I think that's an important thing for people to understand when looking at Civil War medicine. Great. Jake, do you want to pick up there and carry us a little further or anything to go into there as we talk about medical equipment? Yeah, I, I will just say that, you know, I think Andy's just spot on there. I mean, these are all tools that are just, they are, they are basically the same as, as what we see today, the exception of these, you know, methods of, of cleanliness, um, which, are, which are incredibly, incredibly important. But I would say the biggest kind of technological leap that we see in the mid-19th century, and you see it play out in the Civil War, is the use of anesthesia. Anesthetic is available widely during the Civil War, from the records that are kept during the conflict, we know Union and Confederate, 95% of surgeries performed during the Civil War were done under anesthesia. So the idea of biting on the bullet, biting down on a strap, these guys given a shot of whiskey and are screaming as a surgeon lops their arm off, it's not true of the Civil War era. Because in the 1830s and 1840s, chloroform and ether are developed and proved to be anesthetic and to work to put a patient out while surgery is happening. And this means, this, this, is, a, this is a revolution. And it actually takes place here in the United States. It, it, that revolution truly takes off here um, and through the 1850s be, spreads around the world. And there's actually some hesitation in Europe about its usage, about, uh, about the use of anesthesia, the, the old methods die hard. Uh, but in, this, in the Americas, in the United States especially, we see these, this uh, new technique, the use of anesthesia, really latches on. And by the time of the Civil War, surgeons are thinking that it is crazy. Uh, it, only, in, only in extreme emergencies do you, you, do you operate without the use of anesthesia. And so that's, one of the, that's probably the biggest leap forward we see from the Civil War. And the use of anesthesia, you, you can't underestimate how important that is in the development of modern surgical techniques. Because you have the ability to put a patient out and render them, as they termed it, insensible, because they weren't fully unconscious the way that if you go into surgery today, you are. Uh, you're not that far deep into this kind of stupor. They, these patients could move. They, they could actually move around a bit. They could verbalize a bit. This is where moaning and groaning um, and, and kind of muscles twitching on the operating table could be seen. But for the most part, these patients are out of it. and They're not going to remember uh, what happened in the operating room. And this means that these surgeons have more time to be more precise, to take their time, be more careful. This isn't a surgery that's going to be, you know, lop off the arm in a minute, move as fast as possible so the shock doesn't kill the patient. Because they're rendered insensible, you can slow down. And surgeries are going to take 15 minutes, 20 minutes. You carefully remove an arm or a leg. Amputation Far, by far the most common surgery of the war. Carefully remove the skin, go through the muscle and tissue, cut down to the bone, remove the arm, throw it out onto a pile. That's true. Um, <laughs> throw it onto a pile, but then carefully close up the wound. Uh, and as W.W. Keene mentioned, of course, not washing your hands for any of this and wa not washing your instruments, um, but they're carefully closing up the wound and then they're making a stump that is going to fit onto prosthetic limbs. So the use of anesthesia has this knock-on effect, that it means that medicine moves significantly forward, and the treatment of ghastly injuries moves very far forward as a result of the Civil War. So the use of anesthesia and its development and the honing of skills around anesthesia is just uh, the importance of that as a revolution in medicine, and especially during the Civil War, you, you just can't underestimate its importance because it has just a long, long-standing um, and long-lasting implications for, for medicine in America and around the world. Sure. Well, I say medicine and technology and quality of life for veterans as well. Um, I'll direct anybody who wants to look at the next step to uh, the playlist that we have uh, for hard rubber and gutta percha because uh, collector and researcher Mike Washner has several pieces that we show in one of the videos that are uh, patent models for the uh, prosthetic feet. So you're gonna set up the you're gonna set up the wound to be able to use with the prosthetic. We can be able to see some of that there. 
I think we caught the answer here, but I didn't catch it clearly. Neither did Laura. She asks, at what point before the Civil War was anesthesia introduced and how long did it take to discover? How was it discovered? Yes. Yeah, so uh, surgeons are playing, uh, medical students actually specifically, medical students are playing around with uh, chloroform and ether in medical schools throughout the 1840s. Um, one of my favorite fads of the 19th century at colleges are ether parties, and they have parties where they take ether and they don't remember what they did. Um, it, it's it's a ludicrous thing, uh, but it, but it gives these guys ideas. They don't remember what they were doing. They don't remember what was happening. What if we use that in the operating room? And so there's some experiments going on in 1846, 1847, uh, and. Somebody, uh, Dr. Morton is going to be the one that kind of takes credit for this. Uh, I think it's W.H.T. Morton. Um, he's up in, in Massachusetts, and he's a dentist and is doing oral surgery on a, on a guy and, and tries it out and, and uses ether and renders the guy insensible, and he feels nothing, and he wakes up from, from this insensibility and has no memory of the surgery. And so there's a bunch of guys who claim credit for this, all kind of at the same time, at the end of the 1840s. And then it gets written about in, in medical studies. It goes into, like, The Lancet in uh, uh, the, the famous medical journal. And people start to pick up on it. And so by the 1850s, ether, chloroform, both are going to be used. Um, ether is considered to be more effective. Problem with ether, and, and ether was used, well into the 20th century. I mean, I, I talk to people oftentimes that visit, at, visit the museum and say, oh, I remember being under ether um, back in the 50s and the 60s. The problem with ether is it's explosive. So uh, you can't, um, if you're operating at night, you, you can't use it with candles. Uh, it'll blow up your hospital. That kind of defeats the purpose of, uh, of a field hospital. Um, if it blows up your hospital. So chloroform was used in those settings where ether wasn't effective. But by the time of the Civil War, surgeons both sides using it all the time. All right, great. Well, our friend Ed Wilson checks in from the UK and says, ether party, crazy students. And I am I see the laughter from all of us around the, uh, around the quad screen here. Well, Jake's telling the story and all of us are going, there's got to be a couple of stories behind the research there. So... Uh, Jim, as we go forward, is there anything you want to take us before we move into the next segment? Is there anything you want to pick up here and take us into yeah. World War One with? Absolutely. And I'll say I'll say two things here. I think really with the idea of equipment, uh, I'm going to briefly hit on both the front end and the back end, the immediate battlefield uh, issuance of equipment and and dealings at the end. And I know that Jake talked a lot about uh, prosthetics, hit it on prosthetics in the American Civil War and the development of those. Obviously, with the First World War and the types of wounds, I mean, helmets are invented in the First World War because of the amount of head wounds due to artillery, due to shrapnel. Um, and with that, and with these types of wounds, you're going to see the invention of modern plastic surgery. Uh, you're going to see all of this different type of equipment that's developed in order to help those who had been wounded during the First World War. The French have a word called, uh, uh, which, which they use, which roughly translates to the broken faces. Um, and these are men who had all suffered horrible facial wounds during the First World War. Um, and you see some early development of that in the American Civil War as well. But um, so you start to see equipment sort of expanded upon. Andy mentioned x-rays not existing uh, during the Napoleonic or the American Civil War. They do for the First World War. And there are units of mobile x-rays that travel the front um, going from with mobile field hospitals to help uh, discover skeletal wounds uh, and other internal wounds in soldiers. But I think another really important thing, and I'm going to hit on this uh, through the rest of our time here, is the liberalization of medical equipment that comes with the First World War, just as Andy and Jake hinted on, uh, obviously with the Civil War equipment in a, in a surgical kit and modern equipment not being that different. During the First World War, that wasn't that different either, falling in between the two times. But you start to see more men have access to it, on uh, even down to non-medical personnel. If you look at a, a photo of a doughboy, an American infantryman on the Western Front, he's going to have a small pouch. They either wore it on the front right bit of their belt or the back left, depending on what unit they were in. And inside that is a bandage. That's issued to them. That didn't happen during the American Civil War. They are giving them equipment that if you're wounded, you have a way to immediately stodge the flow of blood until a medical professional can come and attend to you. The British Army 
every soldier in their jacket in the British Army, there's an inside pocket in the bottom right flap. And inside, again, one bandage for a bullet wound, one bandage, a shell dressing for a shell wound, and an iodine tablet. And occasionally throughout the Western Front, you'll see these glass tablets still popping up to this day on the front. And that's where a British soldier ripped open the shell dressing and the iodine tablet fell out. So it, it's, you know, they're starting to issue this out and understand that battlefield treatment, wound treatment, starts with the soldier himself. It doesn't necessarily start with someone in the medical field. So that liberalization of equipment, I think, is something also that's not really uh, talked about that often. It's a very minor detail, but I think one that's incredibly important. Great. Well, gents, we've been going for about 50 minutes here, so we'll move on and keep things <laughs> going for everybody there. Uh, let's talk about medical organization and how we see the changes go. Andy, do you want to pick up with how we're basically organized or anything to p start us off in the conversation with? Yeah, I mean, I think a good place to start is, you know, we've used the touchstone of the British Army a couple times. Going back to James McGregor, I talked about him earlier. Um, you know, the British Army during the Napoleonic Wars, they have the Army Medical Board, which is the predecessor to the current Royal Army Medical Corps. It only is around for about 20 or about 10 years before it's disbanded. But at the time, the highest order of surgery or highest order of medical organizations at the regimental level, regiments contract for their own surgeons. They are not commissioned officers. They are members of the mess. They're considered officers, but they're not commissioned by the queen or king. Um, and so in terms of medical organization in the peninsula, they're organizing hospitals using the surgeons from the army or from the regiments. But the, but the transportation is local Spanish and Portuguese peasants that they're contracting to use their infamously terrible two-wheel carts. You know, um, so there's no, there's no organized transportation. There's no really organized structure beyond just doctors. You know, in the same way that you begin to see into the Napoleonic War and going forward. And especially, you know, I know Jake wants to talk about this, so I won't, you know, like the the – volunteer organizations aren't there yet. And I think that's a big part and hopefully a good segue for him to talk about, you know, Crimea again in the civil war and all that kind of stuff. And I, I'm going to steal real quick and, and say that there's still a very important aspect of a medical officer being attached to a combat unit in the British army and that then, and still to this day in the mess, which you mentioned, Andy, they're still the ones to pick what bottle of wine is served. So that is a British military tradition still existing to this day for the medical officer. <laughs> Well, okay. I'm, I'm drinking whiskey tonight, not wine, so I don't have to worry about having Doc around here. But if we're on a battlefield, we need Doc, and we're moving forward. Jake, your turn. Yeah, so uh, this is, you know, it's important to see as the as the war, as warfare becomes more industrialized, I won't, won't, you know, go into, you know, when it becomes industrialized, but as warfare becomes more deadly, you do see this change that is beginning to take place that is going to see... You know, you're, you're going to need to move your where medicine is happening from the regimental level upward. You're going to need to move that organization because you don't have the resources available in each and every regiment or even in each and every brigade to take care of soldiers. You see this starting, kind of see this in Crimea a little bit, but the Civil War is where this really takes off. And this is where Jonathan Letterman is going to come back. And you're going to hear me talk about him over and over and over again because he's that important. So in the U.S. Army – at the outset of the war, and this is going to be the same at the outset of the Civil War, this is going to be the same situation on the Confederate side as well. Hospitals, everything was organized, going back to the Napoleonic era, regimental level. That's where your hospital was set up. It was a regimental hospital. You only cared for soldiers from your regiment. Problem with that proved itself pretty quickly, which is that these battlefields aren't, you know, they're not uh, pleasant, uh, easily discernible places to travel. And so if a wounded soldier ends up in a different regimental hospital, there are incidents that are documented that surgeons in those hospitals would refuse to treat those patients uh, until after their own wounded were cared for. So this is a major this is a major problem. Also, the other issue at the outset of the Civil War that you see is that these hospitals, these regimental hospitals get very easily overwhelmed and they weren't put in they weren't located in a in an intelligible way. The local regimental surgeon placed his regimental hospital typically behind where his regiment was fighting the problem is those that were closest to major roads or pathways through woods where the fighting is happening all of those wounded are going to funnel to the nearest hospital 
And they're not going to go looking necessarily for their own regimental hospital if they're suffering from a grievous gunshot wound. Or there are those carrying them, the, the, whether they be comrades or whether they be stretcher bearers like musicians, that sort of thing. They're not going to take them to, you know, their regiments of hospital necessarily. They're going to take them to the closest hospital. And that means those hospitals get overwhelmed. So what Letterman does, and then Confederates are going to pick up on this too, they're going to design hospitals, field hospitals, organize them at the division level. Pool your resources together. Pool, whether that be human resources, whether it be the surgeons, the assistant surgeons, the ambulance drivers, the stretcher bearers, the hospital stewards. You're going to pool all of those in one place. You're going to pool your supplies in one place as well, centrally located. This means that at the division level, or many times even higher at core, or even at army headquarters level, the medical officers attached to army headquarters will place these hospitals. And the design and the idea behind that is that you're going to put them in centrally located ideas where the wounded can easily funnel to those locations and find those hospitals. So that is going to be revolutionary. Um, and that is going to mean that if care is going to be more efficient, it's going to be faster. Antietam's a great example of this. Again, you're going to hear me talk about it um, because at uh, Antietam is the first time the Union Army is going to use this principle. And within 24 hours, 10,000 wounded soldiers using Letterman's new plan, the ambulance corps he establishes, are going to bring the wounded to these hospitals, and they're going to receive medical attention in these division hospitals. Within 24 hours, it was mind-blowing um, that this happened, and it proved effective, and it's going to become the case throughout the U.S. Army. Throughout the Confederate Army, is often they're often going to design their hospitals at this larger sense. Sometimes that's at the brigade level. Most times that's at the division level in the Confederate um, in the Confederate system. Sometimes you're going to see core hospitals established as well. But this idea that you're treating patients in this larger sense in this larger system uh, is going to take place and take root during the Civil War, and that is going to be one of the most effective parts of the Letterman system that he established, and it's going to transcend sides of the conflict is going to be used by by those on both sides cool well let's take it and move forward jim where do you how do you want yeah, to take I, this and go ahead and then when you're done i've got a question for you out of the uh comments absolutely so um i think uh starting kind of off jake's point here you are going to have a medical officer at the battalion level keeping in mind that in the first world war uh american infantry regiment has three battalions so you're going to have a medical officer for the battalion level all the way up a division staff has a chief medical officer in all major militaries fighting in the first world war brigades will have medical officers the war diaries for these medical units that are attached to divisions, brigades, they all exist. You can go read them, and they tell you what units they had wounded coming in from. They tell you the types of wounds. So it's a standardization of that system you start to see developed during the First World War. So you have a much wider spread of medical personnel at that higher level for uh, the larger amount of wounded that you see. What I also think is interesting, if we take it more on a micro scale, you have medical personnel in combat within, in the frontline units. Obviously, when you enter the First World War, much like the Civil War, you have the musician, the bandsmen who are there uh, to take off wounded, but those men aren't necessarily medically trained. During the First World War, that practice continues while you have these guys up there. But then with a standard infantry battalion of the U.S. Army, you have what they call sanitary men. Uh, and that comes from the fact that the French are using sanitaire for their, for their term for their medical orderlies because this idea of cleaning wounds, right? Um, the German word for medic still is sanitator. But um, so you're going to have these sanitary men going into the assault with the frontline troops with the expectations that casualties are going to occur and you are going to have someone there. And you guys should have a photo up on your screen right now of a sanitary man who's standing on the right. You can actually see he's got the medical corps uh, collar dogs on with the, the uh, two snakes going over each other. So that is a he's not a doctor, but he's got medical training. The equipment he's carrying is specific to help deal with wounded men. The man that's actually he's holding is a shell shock victim. That's a, But that is considered a wounded man in the U.S. military. So he's there. He's assisting. He's up the front lines. You're going to see countless casualties from these uh, front line medical units. Navy corpsmen are going to be there serving in fighting units of the Marines on the Western Front. So, so there's there's a, a, a wide sort of dispersal of medical personnel, not only at that battalion and up level where we think of officers at operating stations or at frontline aim posts, but literally with the guy with the rifle within several yards of him within a football field is going to be someone who's had some level of medical training. 
And I think that's really the interesting thing when we talk about medical organization. Great. Well, thanks for that, Jim. Let me ask a question here from Lynn in the in the in the comments. And she said, "Is blood or plasma transfusion, human or other animal, a practice evolving in World War One? Also, is there an awareness of biological warfare in World War One?" Yes. So uh, I'll start with the first one: uh, blood transfer, transfusion, plasma, all things that they're uh, dealing with at not necessarily the frontline aid posts, but when you get them evacuated into rear into base hospitals. Um, blood transfusions are, are, are common. Um, the, the, and, and there's an, a call for blood, not, not necessarily in the scale that we see today in, in terms of the modern Red Cross putting out a call, but um, there is the idea of, you know, getting new blood into the system. Uh, in terms of biological warfare, obviously uh, gas warfare is an incredibly um, disruptive uh, form of warfare. Not actually as many casualties from it as uh common you know battle wounds um it's mainly a fear weapon and that's because and this is a good message for today everybody put on their masks when they need to so um there's uh you know there you see a lot of casualties who do suffer from gas my great uncle mentions that he suffered uh, gas wounds who go to a rear area but are treated and immediately sent back out to the front they're they're not necessarily serious gas wounds relatively few numbers of deaths and that's because they get the equipment out relatively quickly. The first uh, German major German gas attack on the Western Front is in April 1915. Uh, it hits French, uh, Algerian, French, Moroccan troops, as well as some Canadians. And within the month, anti-gas equipment's being issued to Allied soldiers on the Western Front. So it's consistently uh, being kept up with. Uh, and to the point that there's several American accounts, uh, Hervey Allen, who's a officer in the 111th Infantry of the Pennsylvania National Guard, he has one of the best American accounts of the First World War. I absolutely love it because every day he says, we had a gas alarm and it was some guy who was just freaked out of it. There wasn't actually gas, but he thought he smelled mustard. So it's really just this fear of it. But but again, guys are are starting to really understand how horrible of a weapon it is, and they're going to have treatments uh, and ways of counteracting it through their masks um, or through immediate washing of their respiratory system uh, at rear areas. What we don't hear as much about, but which certainly exists, are men who are suffering from very, very light gas poisoning, who then suffer respiratory issues they wouldn't have other suffered uh, if their lungs hadn't been weakened. Um, my great uncle was gas and he caught typhoid. Um, and you see other soldiers who catch pneumonia who are otherwise perfectly healthy, but they had been gassed. Um, so you start to see that sort of, of weakening of the system. But so it's, it's very well aware, very well established. Chemical warfare had been around since before the First World War. Even though we think of these horrible, you know, killing gases like mustard gas, chlorine gas, tear gas, and other uh, chemicals like that had been used previously. In 19, as early as the fall of 1914, the Germans and French are using it against each other. So it was something that folks had seen coming on the horizon and had some sort of idea of preparing for it. Okay, great. Uh, let me do this real quick. Uh, Jim, we didn't get anything worked in here, but I know you've done blog work about your own ancestors' experience in World War One, and that's a touch point for you. Will you copy the link and put that in the comments here so other people can chase that along? Can do. Okay. Then let me ask this before we transition to evacuation mm -hmm. care. TJ K Casey asked, and I, let me round robin the three of you in the areas you're representing tonight. So how did field hospitals designate themselves as hospitals? Was there something like a Red Cross that marked their hospitals? Andy, let's. do you have anything out of the older eras? I don't have anything out of the older eras that I know for sure that they're using to mark anything. Okay. Jake, in the Civil War, how did we find a hospital if we were looking for a designator or a marker? You would be looking for a gigantic red flag. Um, so red, red flags were used... Uh, uh, were used as symbols of field of field hospitals. Um, if you were looking for general, larger general hospitals, uh, the U.S. Army used a yellow flag with a green H on it. But uh, by and large, uh, field hospitals and other hospital facilities on the battlefield or in the vicinity of the battlefield, even ambulances, were marked with red flags as the Red Cross had not yet become part of the United States until good old Clara Barton comes along and uh, brings that to the U.S. in the 1880s. All right. Well, we're seeing Clara Barton right now. And uh, Jim, what do we look for if we're looking for a hospital well, during World War One? With many thanks to the woman on the screen, you're going to look for a big red cross. 
Um, and that goes for both sides. German, it is the inter, a German allied. It is the internationally accepted sign of this is a medical position. Don't shoot at it. Um, the one exception you would see, of course, since we're talking about a worldwide war, is in the Middle Eastern front. The Ottomans are using a red crescent. So, uh, and again, you still see that to this day in many Middle Eastern countries. So, it, you see again the standardization of, of uh, symbology. So, well, I think it's an important thing to talk about this too, though, that this is where you're seeing the international law of warfare being codified, and you see Geneva Conventions and things like that that are giving legitimacy to those symbols to make them set aside from targets of warfare. Cool. Well, let's move on. A man's been wounded in combat. We need to get him out of there. Uh, let's try and be brief if we can, gents, but let's talk about evacuation care. So evacuation care before the Civil War, I mean, I think a lot of people kind of think about a guy being wounded and being immediately treated, and they forget the fact that that can be, you know, months or years or a lifetime of follow-up care for that wound. You know, the wound doesn't just end with that initial stabilization surgery or the initial treatment. It's going to go for a long time. You know, in the Napoleonic War, you have the British Army has the uh, Chelsea Army Hospital, which is still around today. Um, you also had the Greenwich Hospital, which originally was a uh, retirement home and eventually shifted into a long-term. Both of them served as long-term care facilities. Both of them were overwhelmed by the amount of wounded from the Napoleonic Wars. Um, also in France, you have uh, Les Invalades in Paris. I'm sure I butcher the French like always, but... At the time, that was the, the same kind of thing, a long-term care facility for retirees or people who have been debilitated by wound in combat. But the problem is you're still looking at either wagon transport or ship transport to get someone back. It's a long, it's a long distance from the battlefield, that initial hosp field hospital, back to these cities where you're getting permanent care. And I think that's a big thing we're talking about the Civil War is the development of fitting into that puzzle of where do I treat people that need longer-term care you know, in the modern hospital, you know, if you watch a show like MASH, you talk, hear them talk about, you know, 4077 is a MASH hospital. They send them to the EVAC hospital. And the EVAC hospital sends them to the general hospital in Tokyo. There's a whole chain that goes all the way from the medic to that general hospital. And I think in the Civil Wars, you're starting to see that plug in. But before that, it's really you've got the battlefield and the general hospital. All right. Well, Jake, I know we've talked about Letterman already organizing things. Let's talk about the yep. Civil War. Yep, and that's a that's a great transition, Andy. Thanks for for saying that because this is where the Civil War, you know, plays a, a key role uh, in in the evolution of battlefield medical care and that transportation system. Uh, so the idea at the beginning, at the outset of the war, there is very little. Uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, there is very little in the way of a well thought out evacuation plan. What happens when a soldier is wounded? The measures you do see are musicians are supposedly the ones who are supposed to be stretcher bearers. They prove to not be trained, and they prove to oftentimes just run away and not do their job. So that is going to fall to many times comrades of those soldiers who are wounded at the front. In the Civil War, we see many of them are, are relatives, friends, family. They come from the same communities. They're caring for one another. That's all well and good. The problem is it takes able-bodied men off the front lines, and this means you're taking away military strength from those units. And so in order to fix that, Union and Confederate medical officers are thinking about how can we organize how can we better do this job to mean you know to make our regiments at the front lines better at fighting and having more able-bodied men and we get rid of these comrades bringing their friends off the field and using it as an excuse to get away from combat the way they do that is they establish organized trained stretcher teams that are designed to go out onto the battlefield organized ambulance corps men whose job it is they're not medically trained but their job is to go out pick up the wounded and bring them back to aid stations and then ultimately to the field hospitals and so that is going to radically improve the evacuation system of getting wounded men from the front to the hospitals it means faster time faster response times better treatment uh, and ultimately is going to mean you're going to have men at the front with confidence and this goes to morale with confidence that they know if they get hit there's someone whose job it is they are trained to come get them and bring them to the hospital and that means all of the difference for those men fighting at the front fantastic uh and i think go ahead jim no and i think yeah again as we move this forward to the civil war there's or to 
Which one am I? World War One. That's it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but as we moved forward into World War One of the First World War, I mean, the, you, again, you see these systems and you start to kind of see the hints of, of men still wanting to pull their comrades out of the front line. Um, you know, obviously, they might not all be from the same town, same communities anymore, but there's still this trust of I'm serving alongside you. I know who you are to the point that in Britain, the Royal Army Medical Corps, RAMC, starts to get the nickname from frontline soldiers that it's actually rob all my comrades. Because there's this idea that they're actually taking all their wallets and stuff as they're being carried away wounded, which isn't totally untrue. Um, more so for the German wounded that they're picking up. But um, there's there's so there's these general ideas of well, and there's multiple more stages. Obviously, we hinted at these general centralized hospitals you see in previous eras. They just add more stages onto that, and especially when you're in a military like the U.S. Army, who has the AEF deployed in France, there's multiple stages to get them from frontline care to rear area care to base hospitals at the ports of France and then to care in the United States as well. And we start to see care really being heavily focused for all veterans, both wounded or non-wounded after the war as well with the development of the VA system. Great. Well, we're chipping off some other stuff there. Um, yeah, Huck Green's giving you a little bit of a hard time, says you don't even know your time frame there, Jim. That's because he doesn't know which century he's in, because we were talking about Jim's continental work for interpretive before we started this evening. <laughs> uh, let's move forward and talk about follow-up care. Uh, who wants to jump in and start here? I see a name that's pretty popular. Uh, go, go ahead, Andy. Um, I was just going to say real quick before that, you know, again, as I've been giving this, hey, what came before? The unfortunate thing with, you know, before we hit these large citizen armies is that the state really treated their armies like they're almost mercenary. Like, hey, it was very contractual. I paid you money. You served some time. You're done, whether it's you wounded, whatever, and I'm done with you. And, you know, for example, after the Napoleonic Wars, there's a huge influx in the UK of wounded and disabled veterans that get no state support, nothing like that. They are just, uh, you know, they're just let loose. And it's really tragic, some of the stories you hear of these soldiers that are doing these really demeaning things just to make money just to provide for themselves. And there's no there's no concept of a duty from the state to its wounded soldiers. Um, you know, there's no physical therapy. There's nothing like that. Like, you get treated well enough to get done with the hospital, and you're just on your own. And that sets us up. Jake, let's have you pick up there. Yeah, so I will just say before, kind of to, to Andy's point, talking about the, a lot of veterans not getting care, uh, from these earlier conflicts in Europe, in the United States, you are beginning to see after the Mexican War, you are seeing the, the idea of establishing an old soldier's home. You know, there, there are these ideas that are starting to kind of crystallize, and the Civil War is going to really in, influence that a lot. But to go to kind of follow up care immediately, so follow a soldier from battlefield injury, battlefield field hospital to follow up care, that follow up care and the establishment of general hospitals is all based on the work of essentially one woman in Europe during the Crimean War in the 1850s, and that's Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale, nurse, very famous for, for her work in reforming British Army hospitals in the Crimea, also then bringing those ideas home to, to the UK uh, and helping to establish new hospitals that were built on the idea that cleanliness was super important, that good air, again, going to this idea that bad air is what spreads disease and infection, uh, lots of airflow. These ideas, she wrote about this extensively. She was a statistician, really, more so than she was a, a nurse. Um, she was very into to mathematics um, and, and using that and using data to really change the way you you treat wounded and sick people us and confederate medical authorities pick up on those ideas and just bring them to the united states and so you see these ideas of these giant pavilion style hospitals that's the name you always see with these general hospitals you see it in in here in dc with the a lot of hospitals established on this idea you see it in richmond chimborazo the famous uh, hospital that treats put darn near a hundred thousand casualties from uh in the confederate side these ideas of these large hospitals lots of windows keep them clean they this is the idea and the, the 
to follow-up care that comes from Florence Nightingale. So she's incredibly influential. And many of the people working in those hospitals, too, uh, we think of the Civil War Hospital as a social laboratory. You're going to see the first African-American doctors in these hospitals working. You're going to see uh, women taking up positions as uh, in the medical fields, both as doctors in some, in some rarer cases, but mostly as nurses and, and many of the other roles that are needed in these hospitals. So as much as medical care was going on there, there was also social change happening in those hospitals. And that is going to go on after the war. You see pensions coming in uh, for, for federal soldiers. Um, state pensions are also going to be a thing. So the idea of medical care doesn't just, and caring for these veterans doesn't just end when they walk out of the hospital door, whether they go back to their unit or go home, this is going to follow them on. And I think this is a good point to say, you know, we, we stopped paying the, la the last Civil War era pension, what, a couple weeks ago? Couple weeks ago? <laughs> Yeah, so this is something, this idea really crystallized during the Civil War time period. Yeah. Sure. Well, and, I, and, you know, there's old soldier homes uh, that popped up in a lot of the states after the war, too, that are still open. I mean, if you pull up a list of VA old soldier homes, there's the national ones in uh, D.C. and stuff. But I think there's something about 50 or 60 old soldiers homes throughout most of the states that are relics of the Civil War, but still around providing services to veterans today. Yeah, yeah, and uh, Huck Green chimed in just a second ago to that, and he said his 20 years in, a uh, few bucks of his pay always went, uh, got pulled to the old soldier's home and airman's home. So charity still being, or deductions still being made and taken there. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me ask a question here as we talk about follow-up and long-term care that comes from T.J. Casey out of Tennessee. How were Confederate veterans taken care of after the war since they lost it? That one is a much more complicated uh, conversation because it really varied state by state. And in the aftermath of the conflict, I mean, the, these states had no resources. I mean, many of them are, are destroyed. Uh, their institutions are destroyed. Uh, their families are destroyed. And, and ultimately, at, at least initially, it really fell mostly on the families um, of these soldiers to, to care for their, you know, Dis, in many cases disabled in various ways and disability and this is a, a great conversation we had on our on our site uh, for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine with Sarah Hanley Cousins uh, who just wrote a book about disability and, and Civil War veterans um, that these these men went home and then there is just you know various forms of disability we of course think of you know soldiers with the empty sleeves missing arms and legs but most of the disability experience after the war was related to, uh, you know, they were marching around too much. And so rheumatism becomes a problem and their bones are creaky and they, you know, it, everything hurts. Uh, chronic diarrhea becomes a major problem in the aftermath of the conflict as well. Um, so these, these guys are in such rough shape and they're in the South are no institutions to care for them. Now, as the South begins to rebuild, you do see the states beginning to take over control of that and, and try to deal with that situation. And they have very strong pride in those uh, Confederate veterans and want to care for them. So you start to see state pensions coming in. You start to see state veterans homes. We have a, a an exhibit in our museum about a Confederate old veterans home in Maryland. Um, even in a border state, you saw this. So that, I will say just in, in brief, just to, to sum it up, initially it falls on the families then it is going to transition to the states um, once there are resources available. Great. Well, I'm going to take the follow-up care conversation and pitch it to Jim. Jake, if you would go ahead and take that conversation you had with Sarah about her new book, if you could throw that into our comments for folks in case TJ or somebody else wants to see it and get some folks driving your way. So, Jim, we're talking about follow-up care in World War I. Where are you at there? Yeah, I mean, so all of this, again, as we've sort of hinted at, uh, there's standardized groups that deal with this in the United States. And we're talking about groups that are going to be dealing with more than just gunshot wounds. You're going to be dealing with shell shock veterans, what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you're going to be dealing with victims of gas warfare, vic victims of something from burns, from uh, not, well, many people think, oh, they got hit by a flamethrower. We're talking about the concussive explosion of a shell. Um, would cause serious burns to, to men as well as other um, other issues. But one thing I, I did really want to hit on that we kind of skipped over with Florence Nightingale was the democratization of care through who's, who's caring. And one person I really want to highlight in that story is Elsie Ingalls. Uh, Elsie Ingalls was a surgeon. She was a doctor uh, from Edinburgh, Scotland, 
Um, and she formed a unit called the Scottish Women's Hospital. And she uh, offered the services of the hospital in 1914 to the British Army, who said a woman's place is not the front. So she went to Serbia uh, and, and brought the Scottish Women's Hospital with her. And with her success there, you start to see other branches of the Scottish Women's Hospital formed in France on the Western Front. And almost every single member of staff of that hospital was female. So you're starting to see the real liberalization of care instead of just women being the nurses like a Florence Nightingale or a Clara Barton helping out, assisting in an unofficial way uh, in a field hospital. You're starting to see women as part of the standard medical uh, services on the front. And thousands of American women are going to be sent to France and Flanders to serve in a medical capacity, whether that be through uh, actual physical medical care or psychological care through uh, services like the Salvation Army Donut Dollies, who they knew were there not only to serve donuts and a hot cup of coffee because it's nice to have donuts and a nice cup of coffee, but because seeing a smiling face and getting something warm in your stomach was insanely important to guys who were sleep deprived and suffering from what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, you, that real liberalization is, is a final thing I want to hit on um, as we really talk about care both on and off the front and, and service away from the battlefield. Great. Well, let's turn it, and uh, we've hit a number of things that are on our outline so far, but there's a few more things and just worth talking a little bit as we talk about aftercare, um, PTSD and after the wars. We've gone in here a little bit, uh, but anything else you fellows want to talk about in this area? Yeah, if I could, um, if I could jump in there uh, quick just to, uh, to, to mention um, Dr. Jacob Mendes da Costa, I have a, a good friend of mine, another conversation that I'll throw into the, uh, into the comments section. Uh, Jacob Mendes da Costa worked in Philadelphia during the Civil War at a hospital, a military hospital, and he becomes an expert in what becomes known as irritable heart. And uh, my conversation with uh, Dr. Ashley Bowen goes into this in, in depth. This is her, the subject of her dissertation, which is fantastic. She talks about kind of this forerunner to post-traumatic stress disorder. You may have heard of the term soldier's heart. Uh, irritable heart is kind of the, the origin of what later becomes known as soldier's heart. And this is the idea that soldiers are coming into this hospital where DaCosta is working and they have these unexplainable cardiac conditions. They have no physical wounds in, in most cases, but they have this unexplained cardiac condition. And in, in addition to this, they're also experiencing things that uh, are reminiscent of what we would call post-traumatic stress disorder today. And so he is saying that this is a physical symptom. This is something that he is, he is kind of validating some of their experiences. And this becomes kind of common common, uh, you know, this diagnosis becomes, well, pretty well known after the Civil War. Uh, and it's going to lead up towards um, where we get to with uh, things like shell shock uh, coming up in, in World War I. Uh, but Jacob Mendes da Costa, worth looking up, and I'm going to send the, uh, I'm going to put the conversation I had with Dr. Ashley Bone into the comments. Good. Andy, I'll come to you in just a second. I saw the jump yeah. there. I'm going to say also uh, to the soldier's heart, uh, we've met one veteran in Civil War Digital Digest who we've talked about that. Uh, if you look back to the first H.H. H. Bennett episode with Dave Rambo, the episode about Bennett himself, Dave talked about soldier's heart, which the Bennett family called the Bennett Blues that he had after being home and how he would just go wander he was taking photographs, but his wife stayed home to do the business photographs, and he went into the woods, and they said a lot of times this was the blues that he had. Uh, Andy, turn this over to you. Yeah, I, you know, PTSD, is a, it's gone by a lot of names over the years. You know, Jake hit off with, you know, Civil Wars was first starting to really be understood. A big part of that is PTSD is a trauma-based disease, right? It's, But I think a lot of people talk about it's not just that the severity of trauma, but it's also how often it's experienced or how many times it's experienced and how often. And so one of the big things with the civil war is you have this increasing pace of combat. Instead of, you know, like even the beginning of the civil war, an army might only fight two major battles, three major battles a year. And suddenly you hit the Atlanta campaign, the overland campaign, and soldiers are fighting every single day. And the idea that not only are you sustaining some level of trauma every, you know, um, but that you're talking severe battles, skir like you have this constant stress on you. And that is what's really driving an uptick uh, of PTSD as you go into the modern warfare. One of the accounts of the Civil War I love is Rufus Dawes. He's eventually a colonel of the 6th Wisconsin. There's a lot of great things I'll pull from his account and will I see you smiling. But, you know, one of the things is it's 
you read about him over the Overland campaign. By the end of the summer, he is the only officer in the Sixth Wisconsin who's never been wounded. And he, you can, you can actually, as you read it, you can feel him. You can feel the PTSD starting to build in him. And he eventually resigns his commission and goes home because he's to the point that he's become combat ineffective. You know, at some point, a soldier is going to become combat ineffective if you keep throwing him into combat. And the more you do it, the more often you do it, the worse it becomes. And when we talk about sustained tempo of operations, Jim, do you want to pick up there? Well, obviously, I mean, there's not much more that could be said about, uh, you know, the increasing frequency of combat to the point that even if you're in a rear area, if you're lounging in a farm behind the front lines, you're still within range of enemy long range artillery or enemy aerial bombardment uh, via, via aircraft. Uh, so there's the constant threat. Even at home, if you're a soldier in Lon- from London and you're on leave, there might be a Zeppelin raid there at night. So um, there's, there's that constant threat of death or, or wounding that is going to stress uh, men out. There were thoughts in the war that uh, PTSD, what they call shell shock uh, during the First World War, might be caused quite literally by the physical concussions rattling a man's brain. Be, just because of the amount of artillery. So um, they do look at it very scientifically. Some doctors completely write it off, say it's cowardice. Other doctors say it's something, we just don't know what it is yet. Um, and it takes until the latter years of the First World War for there to be a general consensus. A consensus. And uh, in one of, the, one of the interesting things, it is the U.S. Army Medical Department, the doctors on the front lines recognizing that a lot of times these guys who are uh, what you know, exhausted through combat, what we now call PTSD, um, were just absolutely sleep deprived. They were used to endless combat. They were recycling through men because of heavy casualties so quickly that this mental strain would stay with them, not only for the immediate present during during the campaigns of the First World War, but in the years afterwards. So really the modern sort of acceptance of it comes out of the First World War. I have a, I have a quick question, uh, Jim. Uh, you know, with our kind of evolving understanding of, of TBI, of traumatic brain injuries today, you know, is there any new scholarship out there that's kind of looking back at that idea of shell shock and literally like shaking their brains and causing concussion? Yeah, there is. And I'll be, <laughs> I'll make sure, I'll make sure to link that. Um, there's a great new study of the Royal Army Medical Corps um, that that's done. And again, every country kind of looks at this differently and some are, some are more lenient than others. Some formations within militaries are more lenient than others, but, um, there's a incredibly large, uh, sort of historiography and incredibly large bibliography to this. Um, and I'll, I'll link to a few accounts after where they literally say, I think it's, they, they, I literally think it's because of the shaking of the brain. And this is coming from First World War medical personnel who are really thinking, again, scientifically about this to the point that the battalion a medical officer of the 6th Cameron Highlanders in July 1917 think that if you're wearing a kilt, you'll be less susceptible to mustard gas because the swing of it will wave away the mustard gas. Um, so some really interesting medical thoughts, including some about shell shock and PTSD, and I'll be sure to, to share the link those. Cool. Well, Philip, and I'm not going to try and butcher your last name, Philip, in our comments, said, God mentioned shock lung caused by high explosions. So, again, thinking about how all these different stresses affect the human body. So, well, folks, we've come to the end of almost an hour and a half, our longest live stream yet talking, <laughs> but there's a lot to talk here. And uh, Jake Wynn from the National Mu- uh, Museum of Civil War Medicine, Andy Roscoe, and James Taub, Thank you, fellas. Let me ask one thing, and something we've always tried to do here is just take a minute and talk about what's going on in life, because life is important as we talk about enjoying history. We always end with one cool thing. Jake, you're our guest, uh, the the most the newest guest here. What's one cool thing going on in your world you want to talk about tonight? Ah, uh, well, I I will go to um, kind of what I've been writing about personally over the last uh, over the last several years. Um, I've we talked about it a, a teeny bit tonight, um, and that is the 1918 influenza pandemic. I, I've written a lot about this over the years as it impacted my community that I grew up in, Pennsylvania. I lost a great gra- great great grandmother to the 1918 flu. She was working as a volunteer uh, nurse. So I will say I've been. It's it's been interesting. This isn't necessarily a good thing, just to see how much that work is relating to the experience we're all having now. I ju- will just say that I'll leave it with this: like, take the mask wearing seriously, please. This is like our our one of our only ways that we can help 
each other out and and deal with this pandemic. It is, if anything, if you listen to what we talked about tonight, and it, it, these medical professionals know what they're talking about. They have if all of this as uh, this understanding has evolved over the last hundred years. Please listen to the public health experts. They know what they're doing. Wear a mask, please. Great, Andy. Um. I'm actually going to take, I wanted to take a second as a veteran. I wanted to give this shout out. Um, you know, the, the story, the statistic is unfortunately that somewhere about 22 veterans in the United States take their life every day. Um, less than 1% of Americans will serve in the military in their lifetimes. And I'll just say this. If you know someone who's a veteran, if you know someone that served, take the time to reach out to them. Take the time to see what's going on. Military life is difficult. Military life has a lot of stresses that people don't think about, whether you saw combat or not. And the fact of the matter is that it's a vulnerable population. It's one of the most at, military veterans are one of the most at risk populations in the United States. Do your bit to try to take care of these soldiers after they've come home. You know, not everyone's lucky to end up in a nice job with a family that's there for them still and everything. And I think that when we forget them as a nation, we do all of ourselves a disservice. So that's my shout out for tonight. All right. Jim? Yeah, well, I, I think one thing that I, I would like to get across is we talk about really interesting sort of aspects of history here. And we got a great chance to kind of highlight some sort of forgotten stories. So with kind of the inertia that everybody's getting during their time at home, uh, being able to research their own personal historical projects, take a few minutes out of your day and research something that you wouldn't otherwise heard of, maybe from a group that might not otherwise uh, be in your everyday textbooks uh, for who might not otherwise have huge volumes written about them. Um, I think now is the time as we as we talk as a group to start to uh, really kind of get those those female those minority voices into history, um, and and so that's kind of what I'm working on right now as as I look at some of these women who served in the medical field in the First World War, and it's really interesting because there's not a lot of scholarship out there. So you could be the next you know major Bruce Canton or James McPherson of one of these topics. So um, definitely that's what I'm doing right now, and I, I highly encourage others to get involved in that as well. Great. Well, I'll finish. My one cool thing comes outside and actually from the kitchen. I have white hair now, but when I had blonde hair as a little kid, we moved to the farm that my grandmother was born on, and that's the farm that my girls call Grandpa's Farm. I watched a young orchard become a mature orchard, and this Sunday I took my girls because it's a safe place to be health-wise, to Jake's point, and we picked tart cherries at Grandpa's Farm. I'm heading downstairs because the, all the cherries are not made into jam and bounce yet, so I need to fire up the stove, and we're going to make some jam yet tonight, and I'll stuff some in some whiskey with uh, CWDD Coffee Grinder, Mitch Kreidel's recipe, and we're going to make some cherry bounce, so we'll be doing stuff, and part of this is low food miles. This is where is food, how do you eat local, how do you eat good, how do you enjoy, so other things, other ways to take care of ourselves and take care of our earth. So, um... Huck, uh, leave with one last thought to Andy. Huck Green says, add to add to Andy. If they have a spouse, don't forget to thank the spouses too. I, I look at all the stuff that my wife has gone through in my 11, 12 years of service. She's put in a lot of miles and gets very little thanks compared to the recognition I've gotten over the years. Yeah. Well, gentlemen... Let's leave it with that, with a thank you to all of you for spending an hour and a half of your night. Uh, we'll go ahead and sign off here, and we'll talk to you all in a couple of weeks. The next live stream to announce two weeks from tonight, we will have Shane Seely from Wide Awake Films and Brian James Egan uh, from the Henry Ford on. We will be talking about making historical movies, and then I think we'll be back to wrap up the Last Napoleonic or First Modern War series uh, about a month from tonight. So... Jake, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the shout-outs to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. There's a lot of stuff in the comments. Folks, go check out what they do. I think when we can finally travel again, you're going to see a Civil War Digital Digest episode to introduce you to the museum there, and looking forward to that. Thanks for having me on. Sounds good. Folks, have a wonderful evening, and we will talk to you all later.